Please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, manténganse alejado de las puertas. Happy Monorail Monday, everybody. Another week, another episode of Monorail Monday. It's the second to last episode of Season 3, Episode 17. Now, I will say, I may do a bonus 7th episode. Uh, that depends. I've gotten a couple of people asking me a couple of questions, wanting to expand on some things. So, if there's enough uh, people interested in throwing out some questions, comment below. Stick your questions down there. You can at me on Twitter. You can DM me on Twitter. You can send a carrier pigeon. Whatever you want to do, send a question about monorails, about Disney, working at Disney, things in the old days, being a guest at Disney, whatever. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try and tackle those in a special postseason finale uh, Q&A session. Today we're going to be talking about training. What goes into training in monorails? What goes into platform training mostly? We're going to tackle drive training a little more closely in the next episode. This episode will we'll cover a little bit of overall what goes in on with uh, monorail training and specifically some platform stuff and some information about that. When you come into monorails, the first thing you're going to do is get platform trained. How long you spent working only the platform depends on what era you came into monorails. These days, I've heard of people waiting as long as six months. You train on the platform and then you load the trains and load the trains. You're working unload on the platform, crowd control. But you're not actually driving a monorail, sometimes up to six months. When I was doing it, uh, they needed drivers, especially with the new Mark 6s coming on. They needed more drivers available. So I probably only spent like maybe a month or so as a platform only, and then I was almost immediately drive trained. For platform training, when you came into the department, platform training consisted of basically two days. Two days with a trainer, talking about things, talking about safety, going to the different stations, showing you things at the stations, where the emergency stop button located, uh, what does a kill pack, what does that do, things like that. Platform training is a little bit different uh, now, or the actual platform operation is a little bit different right now versus back in the 80s and 90s and, and even the 70s. Back then, we had the manually operated gates. You see a lot now, you see a lot of the automatic gates. Just press a button, all the gates open, all the gates close. You don't have to do anything with them. And back then, we were having, they had these big heavy slide gates in, in most of the stations. And you would reach up and pull those back. You always had to get people, watch your fingers, watch your fingers. You needed a certain number of platform people to operate the platform and be able to open the gates, pull the gates closed, and you would in be individually loading all those individual gates. And then they started cutting back on the number of people on the platform. They wanted to try and go longer and longer into the day without having as many people loading on the platform. So what we would have is like one guy loading the Magic Kingdom station, and instead of that guy having to open every single gate, and people wouldn't wait. They'd all help themselves and just open the gates themselves, which was a potential safety issue because people always wanted to open the gates before it was time. So they've got the individual gates, or at least they did have the individual gates at the Grand Floridian, the Polynesian, uh, Contemporary. They used to fill those. They used to fill those each time before it got to kind of where they just held you behind a chain. Uh, at one point, long ago, they actually filled the Mark IV monorail cars on the Lagoon Beam, what some of you now know as the Resort Beam, but it was called the Lagoon Beam originally, and that beam, they loaded the cars according to your destination. So if you've gone into the Magic Kingdom, where are you going to? Polynesian? Okay. We're boarding Polynesian destination people in car three. Contemporary people were boarding in car six and car five. So they would board everybody according to destination, and they only opened the doors at that particular destination. So if you said, okay, we're going to the Polynesian, you get in cars three and four for the Polynesian, they'll only open three and four 
at the Polynesian. And those people would get out. There's lots of individual things that used to take place at different platforms. For the contemporary, based on the amount of space on the platform up there, you always had to be conscious of how much, uh, how far the line was backing up. If you were working on the contemporary platform or if you were working at the the turnstiles, you always had to be conscious of how far things backed up up there because you might have to shut off the escalator because the escalator at the contemporary takes you up to the monorail platform. There was no elevator at the time. So you always had to be conscious, where is the line and where am I going to stop people and hold people back here and either tell, tell them you're going to have to wait until the line clears up further up ahead or you shut off the escalator for a little bit. Uh, what we mostly did was just hold the line down at the bottom of the escalator. You just hold the line down there for a minute or two or a couple minutes until the line upstairs cleared a little bit. Uh, the Polynesian, we only boarded the, if you're, if you're a wheelchair coming out uh, at the Polynesian, we wanted to put you in car three, specifically because the ramps that we had back then and car four lined up against those individual gates of the Polynesian. And the ramp come down would come down and there wouldn't be a whole lot of room to maneuver off the ramp. So for that reason, anybody who was going to the Polynesian, we tried to put them in car three so they could actually get off. If you had a, just a little rolly wheelchair, it would be easier for you to just sort of roll off without the ramp if you needed to. But certainly scooters, you needed to be in car three. So there were things like that that you definitely needed to know. Disney is very focused on show and talking to the guests. And you were, they have it written in their, in their training materials here that you can't, you can't uh, wave people into gates without talking to them. You need to talk to people at least in some way. How many in your group? Great. Where you going? Magic Kingdom. Have a great day. They always wanted people to be talking. So I'll show you some of the training material here. I've got a little, little form here. Highlights just a couple things. Talked about safety, priorities of safety, safety of our guests, number one, safety of ourselves and our fellow cast members, two, and the, yes, the safety of the material Disney property, three. So guests first, us cast members second, uh, the monorail train or the gates or any of that stuff, Number three, want to keep that stuff nice, but if uh, we have to sacrifice a guest to do so, we'd rather not do that. It's kind of what Disney's saying here. There's even an item here about using a scoop. If you're using a scoop or other approved item to secure an article from the trough, there must be another cast member watching with a finger on the kill button for the trough that you are working by. We had little uh, little scoops or little things that we could pull something out of the trough if somebody dropped it in the station. We're talking where the, the, the pit where the beam sits. You weren't going to climb down there, certainly, but you could reach down there and pull something out. You have to call and tell the next train to hold. Even if they were further away, you'd tell them to hold just so they aren't approaching the station while you're trying to, to take this item out. The other element of that is the kill pack. Those were introduced so that you could remotely kill power to the beam anytime somebody was walking over the beam, getting too close. A lot of people like to lean over from the unload side after trains left. And, you know, what's it look like down there? But you had a little remote pack. It was like a, it's like a little beeper or a little phone with a little host, holstered belt clip. And it just had a button where you could hit a little red button, kill power to the station. And it killed it on both beams. It was just a station-wide power kill. Somebody goes too close, somebody's reaching in the, with their scoop trying to pull something out, boom, you just kill power instantly. Now, once you got past platform training, now we're talking drive training. And drive training, which of course took place a month, two months, six months after you've been platform trained, you've been working on the platform, now it's time to learn how to drive the train. In drive training, was basically six days plus a seventh checkout day. You'd have a seventh day and you would basically do an oral test, which is basically a, a trainer asking you questions and you responding to those questions. There would be a written test and then there would be a checkout, a practical checkout on the beamway. You would get thrown into a monorail and you'd have to complete a lap on one of the three beams. You didn't know which one 
you were going to be checked out on until just the moment it happened. And they would throw a couple of things at you. So I got a memo here that I want to share with everybody. This is a uh, this is from a trainers meeting in January of 1992. So uh, this is a meeting I would have attended. I would have attended this uh, this trainer meeting in January 1992. I was a trainer back then. So uh, here here are some of the here are some of the things that we were talking about at our trainers meeting. Do not use a highlighter on SOPs. That's standard operating procedure for uh, those of you who don't operate in SOPs. Trainers must be more accountable for their whereabouts. If there's gonna be a change in your activities, you must update the itinerary. So one of the great things about being a monorail trainer was basically making up your own schedule. You had those six days to decide how and when you and your trainee were gonna get through learning to drive the monorail, uh, figuring out how things work, radio practice, and all that kind of stuff. You could put yourself in a train and, and have no guests in there so that the person could just focus on learning to drive the monorail and focus on where the other monorails were. You had individual drive times, but you, nobody drove the monorail the entire day. You basically made up your whole day. For six days, you could decide how and when you wanted to make things happen. Apparently, according to these meeting notes for January 22nd, 1992, people were, people were being a little too shady with their uh, training schedule and they were just disappearing for, for hours on end and nobody knew where they were or what they were doing. Now, I will tell you that one of the folks I trained had driven the Mark IV monorails before. So this guy was a monorail veteran, he left Disney, he came back to Disney, and he of course had to go through drive training because he'd been gone long enough, he had to do drive training all over again. And we were getting the Mark VI's, which he didn't know about the Mark VI's. So we actually did training for him. So of course this guy, he's got to go through the whole six days of training, but he knew what he was doing. He probably needed maybe one day to get familiar with the Mark VI systems. And, and he, he was good to go. But we had to do the entire thing for six days. So my training with him was mostly just like, you wanna drive for a bit? Sure. You, you wanna go do something else? Yeah, can we just go and sit around? You know, let's just go to the top of the contemporary and just watch the monorails or something. So that, you know, that's what we did. He didn't need six days. So somebody like that, every once in a while you get somebody like that. Uh, your primary draw job is training. If you get lead shifts, it's a bonus, not an inalienable right. So one of the things you did as a trainer was not only train new drivers or train new platform people, but you also would be the lead in the station sometimes. You would fill in as a lead. That was apparently not an inalienable right. I don't know who thought that. I don't remember people thinking it was a right, but obviously, we talked about it because it was in the meeting notes. So trainers also substituted as, pl as platform or station leads uh, as needed, which quite often was needed a lot. On the platform, it says you must work on the platform and demonstrate each position to the trainee. Once the trainee is performing the position, you must work with them side by side. Makes sense. I think what there was happening there is people were showing them something and then going up and hanging out in the console and letting the trainee just kind of sit there by themselves. That means somebody wasn't watching from the console, but I think that's what was going on here. Loaders are not talking to the guests. They should be walking along the train announcing their standing room and sitting room. Loaders are not permitted to wave guests into gates without speaking to them. Talked about that a little bit. New platform operators are not performing well at Magic Kingdom audience control. You must work Magic Kingdom exit at audience control. It's just as important as learning exterior load. So that basically means down at the bottom of the Magic Kingdom ramp, when things back up past the end of that ramp, they want people to gain some experience with crowd control at the Magic Kingdom. You gotta be vocal, you gotta be heard, you gotta be talking to people, and you need to be confident. Uh, and if people are shy and new and don't feel like they wanna say something or do something or know how to handle if something's going wrong, that's a problem. And when you get the crowds backing up, they, people need to know how to handle those situations. If you don't feel comfortable, 
dealing with the crowd and the disaster that might ensue if something happens, then you're not going to be helping. You're going to be causing more problems. And then there's a, then the other notes here are for drive training from this meeting. Trainers are not teaching trainees to check the back cab of the train before bringing out of shop. So when you go to, to shop, you would always get in cab six, car six, to take the monorail out of shop. And you were supposed to check the back cab. You're supposed to do a systems check. There's a checklist. You're supposed to do the cab one and then climb in and drive in car six. People were not checking the back cab. They were just pulling out of shop. E-stops must be checked while holding a chiller plant. And that is basically back near, uh, near Space Mountain. It's a little plant back there. That was a standard stop if you were going to be coming through the switch onto the main line. That was a hold point. And basically that's, that's where you're doing some of your morning systems checks. You would check the e-stop at that particular location. Effective immediately. No additional days of training will be granted. I think I mentioned in one of the previous videos that basically for, for a long time, 50% of people did not pass monorail training. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a little tough. It was not uh, just a, I'm just going to go and push this button forward and we go and everything's good. No, there was a lot of stuff you needed to know. A lot of things you had to memorize and not everybody could do it. So as it's saying here, they don't want any extra days. You can't say, well, on day six, my, my guy's not ready. He needs more training. Now, they're going to do a checkout and see if they pass or not. If they don't pass, they would usually get one extra day of training and a second opportunity to check out. Just the second chance. You fail the second time, sorry, we're going to have your platform only and you will eventually be transferred because you don't have any po possibility of driving. Budget time accordingly. Free time should be training time. Training time should be used wisely. Talk as you walk or wait. Make it a fun game or quiz. Always about the fun. Hey, nothing's changed for me as far as when I was in monorails now, as far as let's, let's have some fun. If we're going to have to be doing some learning or training, let's have a good time while we're doing it. So I, I didn't mention before, I like to take people on to the top of the contemporary uh, and we would watch monorail operations from there. You could have a pretty good view of everything. You could identify where the hold points are. You could point out, okay, if a train's right there, where's the next one to be holding? There's a lot of stuff you could do up there. Uh, sometimes we like to ride in the back cab and we just identify things from the back cab. Uh, so I, I like to mix it up and try and do little things to just make it a little more interesting, a little more visual. A lot of people don't do well if you're just showing them a piece of paper with a bunch of numbers on it. But if you're showing them visually where things are, they pick that up. So I always tried to, to add in the vis visual uh, part of it. And the last uh, memo from, from this uh, trainer's meeting is, radio is getting sloppy. Make sure that your trainees must repeat back radio instructions verbatim. And this means people are just, people are getting way too casual. This is not, uh, till we talked about talking too much on the radio, uh, Budweiser frogs, people making jokes. This is not really about that kind of stuff. It's more or less people getting too casual. There should be a very certain way that you talk to Monorail Central who is the person in the tower sort of keeping an eye on the system and coordinating movement of trains, coordinating with maintenance. You should talk to them in a very specific way. They will respond in a very specific way and getting too casual. They, they didn't like that. They wanted you to respond exactly how you're supposed to respond. So there's one more thing before you go. There's a uh, map here of the Magic Kingdom monorail loop. And it's got lots of hole points on it. And we'll talk a little bit about hold points next time we talk a, a, a bit about drive training as well. So this is going to be some good stuff coming in the season finale of Monorail Monday. I'm going to try to pack as much as I can into the time without making the thing too long. Nobody wants to watch a 45 minute video of me talking about this stuff. Nobody, nobody's got time for that. You got a lot of things to do. So definitely looking forward to that next week in the season finale and reminder, if you got any questions, stick them down below, at me on Twitter, DM me on Twitter, at me on Instagram, ask a question, and we, uh, we might just add an extra bonus episode where we answer some questions, talk about a little bit more, and then we're going to take another little uh, break.
before season four of Monorail Monday. So remember to like, subscribe, share, tell your friends. So thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next week. Remember kids, have a good time all the time. Uh, a little anecdote, some of you may not know, those of you stuck along enough to, to watch the end of this video, the Magic Kingdom actually used to load up the center, you know, where you come down that center ramp and everybody goes into the Magic Kingdom, yay! That originally was the load ramp, just like Transportation Center. You loaded up the center and then you loaded to the trains on the other side. We're going to the resort, we're going to the Mag uh, Transportation Center. That was originally the loads that was in the center and then you exited down the the, the uh, outside and that was changed. A little something I bet a lot of you didn't know.